All right. We are on chapter 34. I must admit, it was a little disappointing to find out that the snake wasn't poisonous. Not that I'd want Chet's throat to swell up or anything. I would never wish something like that on anyone. But an arm infected with poison and a scary trip to the emergency room would have been nice. But then Chet would have a big, dramatic story to tell. So maybe it was for the best. I could picture it now. I went to the emergency room and almost died, man. It was a close call for a while there. The doctor said I was lucky that I killed the cobra when I did. Good thing I had enough strength to demolish it and throw it down the well. Then again, he'd probably tell that story anyway. After Chet walks off, I pick up the pillowcase like it's a dirty sock. I wasn't crazy about the idea of holding something that had touched Chet's sweat, but I'd already littered the woods with my mother's old bowls. The least I could do was throw this atrocious object away. I didn't want some squirrel family to find it, or sacred. The thought of sacred cuddling up with something like Chet's pillowcase did not sit well with me. When I glance back at Jen and Kaori, they seem confused, like they don't know who I am all of a sudden. We should go into business together, Kaori says. What? I ask. Couldn't have heard that right. We should go into business together, she says again. I know about the spiritual world, and you know about the natural world. It's the perfect partnership. That's probably why fate brought us together as friends. Friends. Something about the way she says it makes me feel like I found something. I know it sounds corny, but in that moment, with that one word, I already felt like a different person. Is that possible? Or could it have just been a coincidence, I say. There are no coincidences, Jen and Kaori say at the same time. For that reason, and the same reason, it makes us all laugh. And I don't care that I'm holding Chet's disgusting pillowcase anymore. Once we stop laughing, Kaori's face turns serious. But first, she begins, you have to tell us the truth about something. She and Jen glance at each other. Jen is still holding my bag, and I reach out for it. Is your name really Renee? I stand up straight, as straight as I can, and put my bag on my shoulder. No, I reply. My name is Valencia. Valencia Somerset. Just like a battle cry. Chapter 35. V.S. Kaori was certain she'd never heard the name Valencia Somerset in her entire life, but something felt very familiar about it. Like having deja vu. Something in her brain clicked and said, This is important. Pay attention but she couldn't figure it out. She pressed her lips together tight and tried to force an answer into her vision, but nothing came. It felt so close, like she could reach out and touch the answer if only she knew where it was. Valencia Somerset. Hmm. Renee had straightened her back when she announced her real name, like she was proud of it. Kaori was fond of her name as well. It was critical to feel empowered by your name. Kaori believed that with all of her heart. We should keep looking for the stone, she said. Virgil's been missing for hours. Let's get back to work. Jen's face lit up. I know. Maybe we don't need the snakeskin stone now because we have an actual snake bite. She pointed at the pillowcase that Valencia still had pinched between her thumb and index finger. Well, not an actual snake bite, but snake bite juice anyway. That's got to count for something. She looked at her sister expectantly. Hmm, Kaori thought. Maybe Jen had a point. Surely saliva from a snake's actual mouth had to count for more than a rock, right? It made logical sense. What do you think? Kaori asked Valencia. Never in all her days, not even in her past lives, had she ever asked another person for guidance or advice. But if they were going to be business partners, now is a good time to start. Kaori knew the importance of collaboration in running a business. Valencia nodded. Makes sense to me. But they were interrupted again when Valencia's phone buzzed. The vibration was so loud that Kaori thought it was her own phone at first. It's my mom, Valencia said when she saw the message on the phone. She announced it like she had been given six hours of homework. She wants to know where I am. Ugh. She rolled her eyes. The pillowcase dangled by her side. Kaori was reminded of pictures she'd seen in history class when people wave little white flags to surrender. Do you have to go home? said Jen, whiny and weighty with disappointment. Technically, said Valencia. Kaori was about to say the ceremony wouldn't take long and maybe Valencia could sneak in an extra 15 minutes before she had to go, but 
Then the bells of the Buddhist monastery sounded, and Kaori had to look at her own phone. It was her mother. It was like parents were all in the same wavelength or something. It's Mrs. Tanaka, Kaori told her sister, but the text wasn't asking where she was or when she was coming home. There's the text. Have you seen Virgil Salinas by any chance? Kaori's heart dropped. The fact that her mother was asking meant that someone had asked her, which meant that it was one of Virgil's parents or brothers or Lola, which meant that they didn't know where he was either, which meant that this was a true blue emergency of epic proportions. Kaori texted back. No. He was supposed to come over at 11, but never showed up. She started to type more details, that they were looking for him now, that they were going to have a ceremony, and so on. But if she did that, Mrs. Tanaka might tell her to come home with Jen right away. So she deleted the few words she'd written and waited for her mother's reply. She asked if I knew where Virgil was, Kaori said. It sounded just as sullen as she felt. Something was wrong. Something was very wrong indeed. That means his parents are looking for him. She turned to Jen, so he didn't get held up at home like we thought, and he hasn't been home since Renee or Valencia went over there. Jen frowned. The three of them were quiet for a minute until Jen's face suddenly lit up, just as it did before. Hey, maybe he went off with V.S., she said. Maybe they ran away together, like in the movies. That's impossible, said Kaori. Yesterday he could barely say her initials without choking. Valencia's phone buzzed again. It's not impossible, said Jen, as Valencia texted on her phone. Maybe he sent her a message last night or this morning, and they're off right now, eating popcorn at the movies, just him and V.S. You watch too much television, Kaori said. There's no way he ran off with V.S. That doesn't make any... <sighs> she stopped mid-sentence. What's the matter? Jen asked. Now she understood the deja vu. The reason Valencia's name sounded so familiar and important. Valencia Somerset V.S. Kaori tapped Valencia on the arm. When she looked up, Kaori said, What's your sign? Valencia put her phone away and raised an eyebrow. Why? Just tell me. Are you a Scorpio? Valencia hesitated. Yes. How did you know? Do you go to the resource room on Thursdays at school? Valencia tilted her head suspiciously. Yes. Why? Jen jumped up and down three times. Oh my god, Kaori. Oh my god. It's VS. She's VS. Yes, Kaori said. All business. She's VS. What's going on? Valencia said, puzzled. I don't understand what you're saying. Kaori moved quickly to stand next to her sister, then clamped a hand over her mouth. We can't tell you. Why not? Because. That's not an answer, Valencia said. Obviously, it has something to do with me, and so I deserve to know. Her eyes shifted from Kaori to Jen. So what is it? We can't tell you because it would interrupt fate, Kaori said. She still had her hand over Jen's mouth. Valencia looked like she wanted to laugh. I'm serious, Kaori said. Fate has directly influenced this entire day. It's very clear to me now. Come on, Valencia. Tell me. It'll all make sense once we find Virgil. Kaori could feel Jen's excitement bubbling under her palm, ready to explode. Valencia put her hands on her hips. I'm not going to help you find him unless you tell me what's going on. What if his life is in danger? You'll put his life in more danger just because I won't tell you something? Valencia's face fell. Her arms dropped to her side. I guess you're right. She jabbed a finger in Kaori's direction. But you have to promise to tell me once we find him. Kaori let go of Jen so she could put her hand on her heart. I promise it'll make sense when we find him. If we find him, Jen added. When, said Kaori. When. Chapter 36. Virgil was tired, plain and simple. He was still afraid, hungry, and thirsty. But mostly he was tired. He'd been right all along. There was no point in yelling for help, because no one could hear him. No one would come. All the hours of being terrified had drained him. 
He was too ex exhausted to even worry about Pa. Bayani, of all the questions you ever ask yourself in life, never ask what's the point. It is the worst question in the world. Ruby, what did she know? Since this was the end of Virgil and Gulliver, he hugged his backpack close to him and decided to take a nap. But he didn't want to fall asleep thinking about all the ways he'd failed in life, so he decided to imagine what he would do differently if he was ever rescued. One, he would stand up to his mother and say, I wish you wouldn't call me Turtle anymore. And then she would say, okay, and he could just be Virgil or Virgiligo or whatever. Or the family could have come up with a new nickname for him, like Bayani. Two, next time the bull called him stupid, he'd speak up. Call me that again, you'll regret it, he'd say. There wouldn't be any shake in his voice. He wouldn't just say it, he'd mean it. Maybe he'd even fight him. Or maybe he wouldn't need to because the bull would know he meant business. No questions asked. Third, and most important, he would talk to Valencia. Even just hello. One word. That's all it took to strike up a friendship, right? One word could make all the difference. He said it now in his tired and weary voice. Hello. Hello. It sounded muffled and anguished. That's how everything down here was. I'm tired, Virgil said to no one. I'm going to sleep. I don't care if Pa eats me. He tilted his head back. You hear that, Pa? You can eat me. Just leave Gulliver alone. I'm going to sleep. His Lola had once said the world looks different through newly opened eyes. Maybe if he went to sleep, he would be home again when he woke up and he could do those three things. Maybe he'd be tucked into the warmth of his bed, listening to Gulliver's cage rattle as the guinea pig drank his water. Maybe. All right, that's going to be it for now. Looks like the next time I come on will be the end of the book.